you know, after watching all that curling in the Olympics this week, I think if I really practice hard, I have a shot of making the American team in 2022. I mean, how hard could it be? Ah! Oh! Damn it! Ah! Dang it! Oh! Well, maybe I better just stick to watching the Olympics. Do you live, eat, and sleep the hotel industry? Looking to brush up on your game? You've come to the right place. Welcome to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to No Vacancy with me, Glenn Hausman. I'm so excited to have you here today, and uh, even more exciting to be uh, wide awake. I've been flying all around uh, North America this week. I had a great speaking gig up for uh, Coast Hotels in Victoria, British Columbia. That's on Vancouver Island. What a great place that is. Before, uh, before we get going, be sure if you're not subscribed to No Vacancy News, text the word HOTEL to 66866 and join us. But uh, right now, I want to bring in my, uh, my friend and organizer of the California Lodging Investment Conference Click, which happens to be sold out, so we're not going to have to give you guys the hard sell. Mr. Craig Sullivan, how are you, sir? I'm great, Glenn. Thank you for having me on the show, and how are you? I am doing really great today, although you can't tell from my voice, but I am uh, tired as all heck. Um, I just had such the longest day. I had to take three flights yesterday, as a matter of fact, which is uh, very unusual. I have, rarely have to take three flights in a day. Wow, from Vancouver? That is, that's kind of wild. Well, I was, on this, <laughs> I was on this island, so I had to go from the island to, uh, to Vancouver first, you know, so. Oh, there you go. I, I know, poor me, poor first world problems, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, speaking, uh, speaking of issues uh, and, and problems out there, guys, if you're not out there maximizing your revenue at hotels, well, I got a great idea. Why don't you, uh, why don't you, uh, check out the good folks at Duetto. This show is indeed brought to you in part by Duetto, but I love these folks because they are helping hoteliers make much money it's unbelievable what they're doing. Uh, be sure to check out my recent interview with their CEO, Patrick Bosworth, on what you need to know about revenue strategy and why Duetto is so important to your ability to make more money at your hotels. These guys are great. Check out GetRevenueResults.com, and I'll tell you what, you're going to like what you see. And also make sure that you go on to our No Vacancy feed and download and listen to this great podcast I did with Patrick Bosworth because he is so cool, so interesting, is going to teach you enough. Sorry about that, Craig. How are you going? What's going on by you? You know, uh, it, it's great. It's it's another day in paradise in California. We, as you'd mentioned, we sold out the uh, second annual California Lodging Investment Conference. And <clears throat> actually, excuse me, uh, you know, all the transactions and everything that have been happening out here are a perfect reason why I launched this conference last year. And I'm uh, so glad you agreed to come out and moderate the opening panel again. I don't know if you know this or not, yeah. but we had a record hotel sales in L.A. County alone last year of $1.7 billion. And that's B is in big bucks. Wow, that's a that's pretty uh, unbelievable. Now I want to talk all about what you're seeing in California stuff, but before we get into that, I need to ask your uh, I I need to ask you an important question. So I think we're going to play a brand new game today, and I'm going to call it a Who's the Jerk? Okay. All right, so who's Who's the jerk? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm making this up as we go. So if you're offended by this, uh, sorry, I apologize for it in advance. No, I don't because I want to know who's who's the jerk. OK, so I'm in Victoria <laughs> Island. Right. And we're going to take this. We're going to take okay. this flight over to Vancouver. Now, the flight time is an incredible 14 minutes. And by the way, I got uh, four frequent flyer miles. So uh, thank you, Delta, for, for that. Four frequent flyer miles. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be going to Hawaii any day now with uh, flights like that. So we're getting ready for this big old 14-minute flight that we got to take. And, um, of course, there's a, a delay that lasts, um, you know, so we're stuck on the runway longer than the entire flight time, which is so big, so hard, because the flight's only 14 minutes, right? So, um we were flying over there, and again, just 14 minutes. And before we land, believe it or not, somebody has a medical emergency and faints on the flight. I mean, a 14-minute flight, and you pass out. What horrible luck is is that, right? So what happens here is we pull into the gate, and um, they say, 
could you please remain in your seats so EMS could come on board and handle the situation? Now, first of all, I love Canadians because if this had happened in the United States, you know everyone would just ignore that and get off the flight, right? Screw screw the poor person Stampede, yeah. right? who, who passed out. I see it all the time, you know, with people like uh, when they beg you to sit so somebody could go make a connecting flight and then everyone ignores it and gets up. So that does not happen in Canada, that, you know? Um, I think the most amazing thing to me was um, they said, uh, hey, we're bringing on EMS. EMS, please sit down. And they didn't say, eh, afterwards. So that was, uh, that was exciting. So they bring, <laughs> so they, they bring on the, uh, the EMS people who took like five minutes to get onto the plane once we landed. And they said that, you know, the door was open. They said, sit. It took five minutes from that point for EMS to get on the plane. Meanwhile, we're all just sitting there. Now, mind you, this is a small plane and this particular individual was towards the back of the plane who had this situation so we're sitting there sitting there sitting there the ms finally gets uh, on board they go to the back they start talking to her and 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 craig i'm not joking they're sitting there doing all of the stuff that they have to do for like 10 minutes long right and everybody is starting to get anxious they all have connecting flights so the uh, the flight attendant comes on and she's like the airport has been notified um so don't worry but people are getting more anxious because I think you and I both know that uh, she's uh, full of something over there because, you know, no one's going to hold a flight for somebody who got stuck. Right. So, you know, I, right, find, right. I find that amazing. So this one dude who is in front of me says, um, hey, can't we just can't we just get off now? Nothing's happening. And they're like, no, you have to stay seated. But they're like, uh, but the airplane, the airlines are not going to wait for us. You told us that they're going to wait for us. I don't think that they're going to wait for us. Did they actually tell you they're going to hold all of the flights for all of the people here to connect? And she had to wait. A minute. No, well, we didn't. Uh, we didn't really know that, but we're sure that they will. <laughs> we're like, who, who does that? Who holds a you know who holds international flights for one passenger? The answer: nobody. Okay. So Nobody. everybody's getting really restless. This woman is not having a um, a an emergency of a life threatening nature, right? She's conscious. They're talking to her. They're doing vital signs. This is going on and on and on, and people are just sitting there going crazy. So, um, they wanted to be like, couldn't we just dis- disembark in the plane like one row at a time? Right. So that way we're not blocking the aisle or anything like that for when they're going to move this woman. And they're like, no, you can't do it. So we sat for a total of 25 minutes on the ground with the door open with them dealing with this woman who then just walked off the plane first because she was healthy enough to do that. So who's the jerk? Okay, Craig, I got to ask you, is it the passengers who wanted to get off the plane or is it the airline for not allowing people to get off the plane? You know, you got this medical emergency as a twist. We all want to do the right thing as human beings. But what do you think? Well, I'm going to have to give you the diplomatic answer on that. I think it's a blending of both. I think if it was life threatening, you know, all of a sudden everybody, you know, would dial it back. Right. Not worry about it. That, that person's you know, condition outweighs everything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it wasn't. And I think you could have, especially considering this person was at the back of the bus. Yep. Uh, you could have, you know, started deplaning one row at a time, keeping an eye um, on, on the seated passengers and the EMTs as being the, the flight attendant um, and, and orderly get people out of the plane, down the ramp, and still keep it available for EMTs if they had to, you know, take this person off on a on a stretcher or gurney, or whatever they were using. Um, so I think it's a combination of the two. Yeah. And I think you know you probably had a twin engine uh, prop airplane that uh, held anywhere from twenty four to thirty five feet, thirty six people. Yep. And now you've got let's say uh, thirty five out of thirty six all missed their plane. Yep. Um, not not good customer relations at all. I think there was a way to handle it, especially considering it wasn't life threatening. Well, now, right. Granted, when the EMTs came on board, nobody had any idea. But you know, their triage system is, is pretty darn good. So uh, I'm sure that they figured it out it wasn't life threatening within the first five 
possibly 10 minutes, and that's a, a long period of time, I think. Probably less than five. I'd say more like, uh, yeah, probably 30 seconds or so. I think they figured out that it wasn't life threatening, you know, and they were just yeah. sitting there taking their yeah. time, going through all the procedures that they had to do. So, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think the answer is it's a little bit of, uh, you know, everybody. The airline was kind of being a little bit of a uh, uh, jerky and uh, the passengers were being a little bit uh, jerky because they wanted to get uh, get on with their lives. But it's hard. It's really hard to tell. And I just so everybody knows, don't worry, I made my flight in 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 time. So I was very excited about that. Although, uh, Craig, I did suffer some. I did not get to have a proper lunch. I had to. I had to eat a sandwich on the Delta plane. So that was that was a little sad <laughs> for me. Oh, that is bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, my question is: Was it a soggy sandwich or was it a dry sandwich? <laughs> it was. Uh, it was a turkey, uh, a smoked uh, smoked mesquite turkey sandwich with a slice of cheese on a pretzel roll. And it wasn't soggy because you had to apply the mayo yourself when you got it, which I thought was a, which is a good move. That, that is a good move. But was it actually turkey or was it pressed turkey? Uh, no, it wasn't real. It wasn't real turkey. It was, a, <laughs> it was, it was assembled turkey. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> but don't worry. It only cost Toilet me. Toilet greed. <laughs> yeah, but it was only 11 bucks, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, that's it, okay. It yeah. did come it, with a bag of it chips. It held you over. It did. It did hold me <laughs> over. And I got to tell you, as we're recording this, I haven't eaten since that turkey sandwich yesterday afternoon. So we're going on like 20 hours now. And I, I'm, I'm only oh saying this. Be, I'm only saying this, uh, Craig, because I'm pretty proud of myself for not stopping at some horrific fast food restaurant when my uh, when my flight landed <laughs> at one in the morning. <laughs> so, so good. So good for me. But uh, other things about yeah, a, that is good. I'm proud of you. Yeah, thank you. Other <laughs> things about a 14 minute flight that I thought was hysterical, especially in Canada, they do all the announcements announcements in English and then they do the announcement in French, right? So French. Yeah. yeah. So they take off and they're like uh, you know, welcome aboard and they go through this whole list of stuff that they got to talk about like we're flying 8 hours, right? So they do the whole announcement, then they do the whole announcement again in French welcoming us and they hope we have a great flight and all of this kind of stuff. Then uh, she sits down, and about 30 seconds later, she gets up and goes, we're about to land now, and goes through that whole speech right there, which I thought was pretty funny. That is funny. <laughs> yeah. That is funny. All right. So uh, uh, you know, that's, that's my, uh, my, my, my flight issues. Hopefully, I won't have um, any, uh, any medical emergencies while flying out to you at the California Lodging Investment Conference being held at the uh, Hilton in Orange County on March 8th. Now sold out, so uh, haha, everybody. If you didn't get your seat there, sorry. You kind of miss out. Although, I bet you if you talk to Craig, he might be able to uh, sneak you in, maybe put you in a, put you in the back <laughs> corner, or maybe you could beam the event virtually to people in a, in a second conference room, kind of like how, you know, those Super Bowl parties work at casinos. There we go. Yeah, I like that idea. There yeah. we go. So what's going on I, in California? I think we'll have the camera crews up there. Yeah. So what's going on in uh in, in California now with the hotel market? Let's get into that. I, you know, it's we're we're having uh, a prolonged up up cycle right now in California. I mean we've got like I said, we we, we hit a record amount of sales in LA County alone for one point seven billion dollars. That was an increase of Three hundred and forty-five million over uh, 2016. Uh, you know, median price per key jumped uh, to one hundred and twenty-seven thousand two hundred and eleven dollars. Uh, it broke uh, last year's record at one hundred and twenty. Uh, so I think uh, you know we're, we're doing well. We got a lot of construction going on, um, and right now. It uh, is mainly select service uh, boutique hotels. Uh, you're not seeing any real big resorts. Um, San Francisco, I mean, it's still well over a million dollars uh, uh, a key to build a hotel in San Francisco proper, uh, which, you know, I, I think, you know, adaptive reuse or find uh, an older boutique hotel and and, and redo it uh, makes a lot more sense in that particular market. Uh, but we've got a we've got a lot of construction going on. You know, um, there's a lot of renovation going on in uh, the Anaheim Resort area. Of course, I mean, uh, I think you and I will be camped out for weeks 
uh, ahead of uh, the Star Wars uh, land opening, so well, we can be the first ones uh, in there. Uh, honestly, um, I'm just sticking around in California after the Click Conference on March 8th and camping out at the Disneyland entrance for the next year and a half, so I could be the first guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. I yeah. like that. Well, you know. I, I'll tell you what, we can, we can rotate who's in line, okay? <laughs> that's, that's a good idea. So that way, I could, uh, that way I could still be sure to, you know, go and, uh, you know, go and do responsibilities. I have like being at the AHOA conference March 27th through 30th, where I'm happy to say No Vacancy is the official podcast. And we'll be uh, broadcasting live from the AHOA convention and trade show, which is the largest hospitality convention in the world. And I'll be there Craig, capturing stories and advice from thousands living out the American dream every day, including some of the biggest in the industry. And also thanks to uh, Red Roof Inn for uh, sponsoring the, uh, the, the, the podcast booth, which is going to be pretty awesome. All right, so let's get back. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty. Let's get the show back on the road. Let's go back to the California hotel market, although I could talk about um, Star Wars all day long and sneaking in plugs. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But you know what? I mean, Red Roof's a great group, and you know they're, they've been one of the uh, uh, original sponsors of the uh, Click Conference as well, so I know they're taking very good care of you, and – uh, I'm going to try, I've been trying to rearrange my schedule so I can get to, to DC for the AHOA conference as well. Oh, that'd be great. Um, I I'd... think it's an important conference and you know, it's, it, it is, it's, it, it, it's, it's just a tremendous conference to go to, uh, when you've got the, the opportunity to attend that conference. Yeah, for sure. I'm pretty excited to be, uh, to be going there myself. And I love that it's outside Washington, DC and we're going to have all this recording gear and stuff and I can actually drive down there which is really uh which is really terrific instead of having to take a, an airplane and uh you know i recently got a a car in september my first big boy car that i ever had since moving out of uh, brooklyn we used to have these old junker kind of cars because you know you're living in brooklyn you don't want to have anything that you care about left on the uh, on the street so i'll be driving down there <laughs> in uh you know relatively new ish car which i got a a great deal on thanks to people like uh Craig Sullivan, who's supporting No Vacancy on Patreon.com. You like how I got that plug in? So if you want to go to Patreon.com slash No Vacancy, hey, come on, send me a few bucks every single month. It's not going to kill you for less than the price of a cup of coffee every day. You can do it. You know, I, you know those old commercials where they used to say that all the time. That was back when coffee cost 60 cents. So now coffee is what, like five bucks. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not asking you all out there to drop me 150 bucks a month, but you know, come on, five, 10 bucks. Come on, you can do it. No big deal. You know, um, think about it. Cut out one beer from your month. You'll help your waistline. You'll help me. And it'll be, uh, it'll be great, man. I am full of the shameless plugs today there, Craig. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Your no vacancy serves a you know a, a great purpose in our community, and I'm going to plug you now. Thank you. Um, I listen uh, on a regular basis, um, I, and and there are times uh, on the weekend where I will binge uh, two or three episodes. I put it up on the television, and 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 listen to you uh, throughout the house. And then uh, you catch up on your videos that you're posting and those, those short interviews that you, you do. And you always pass along great information. And that's why I think uh, the industry should support you. And uh, it's, it's, uh, I thank you. And, man, and you're one of two people that are responsible for me doing a radio show. So. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, speaking of the other person, be sure uh, you, you, you connect with uh, Rad Gantos, who's uh, your co-host on the, uh, the California. Uh, why am I totally blanking on the name of your show? You plug your show right now real quick <laughs> on octalknetradio.net. <laughs> Check out That's California. That's it. Check out California. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Check out California. It is on hotels, tourism, and travel into the Golden State from Eureka to San Diego and from Malibu to Fontana. So uh, it's it, we have a lot of fun with that. And like Glenn, we're always looking for, for guests to be on there. And uh, you can you can reach me through octalkradio.net uh, to, to be a guest on the show. And, uh, you know, why don't you just give us your address, too, in case any admirers want to drop by at four in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll let you do that. Yeah. That'd be rather gauche <laughs> if I did it. <laughs> uh, all right. So at some point, we got to continue talking about the California hotel market. Okay. So um, the price per key keeps going. Well, how about going... Kempton? 
Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. But let me launch it up by saying the price per key it keeps rising in terms of uh, you know the the purchase of hotels. You know the real estate uh, cycle that's happening right now, and also we've got that that scenario of it's getting more expensive to build hotels out there. So I want to know what your thoughts are on that, and then let's go into what you want to talk about with Kimpton. You know, um, yeah, it, it, you know, dirt costs, entitlement costs, it, it's, it's a, a floating scale, and it, it's going up, but it's not coming down. Um, and then, you know, because of some of the tragedies that we've had uh, this year, you know, Texas, Florida, Puerto Rico, uh, and, and part of, uh, you know, uh, the south uh, that we're all battered with, with uh, these tropical storms and hurricanes, uh, we're having a bigger issue right now in California, keeping skilled labor here uh, to, to, to build hotels, hospitals, multifamily, office buildings, all of it. Um, it's so, you know, your, your, your labor costs are jumping dramatically. Uh, material costs, steel's always going up and, it, and it's gotten more expensive. So, you know, you know, what I would suggest is, if you've got numbers from a few months ago that you grind them again and, and, and get them updated, oh boy! Uh, because you could have, you could have a huge increase and all of a sudden you've got a bigger gap uh, between your construction financing and the actual cost of the project. Now, you know, uh, part of the thing that, you know, with the lenders that we have involved with the California Logic Investment Conference, you know, we've got guys that specialize in construction loans. We've got guys that do MESDAT. Um, you know, so those, those bridges are there. Financing is still really good. Uh, interest rates are historically still low. Um, have they tightened up the loan to cost for a construction loan? Yeah, you're probably sitting at an average of a 55% loan now versus 60 uh, some cases 65, but I, I mean, that's, that's really about the sponsor and the relationship with the lender. Uh, so, you know, we're still, you know, having, um, we're, we still got more demand than we've got supply. Now we are seeing, you know, and, and this will, this will tie into to Kempton. They're doing a 200 room upscale boutique hotel. that's going to open in 2021 on Harbor Boulevard. Uh, Right in Garden Grove and the right. city of Garden Grove uh, in the last cycle uh, was very proactive. Um, you, you saw more full service hotels go into Garden Grove than you did into the city of Anaheim. Um, you know, they had older hotels that were completely renovated. They had, a, you know, a dozen or so full service properties come online and it, uh, there were, they, that city was really proactive besides just giving you a TOT rebate. They were also, um, you know, fast tracking the hotels. So, you know, they saw the value in that. They saw that, uh, you know, these hotels uh, generate an incredible amount of, of revenue for, for the city they're in. And, you know, I'm fond of telling my neighbors that, uh, you know, you should be, every time you meet a hotel owner in California, you should thank them because they pay an incredible amount of taxes. Uh, and that keeps your real estate taxes down in, in California, especially, you know, because a lot of times fire, EMT, police, trash are all part of your, your real estate taxes on the residential side here. Well, that's held down because of all the transit occupancy tax and various mm. other taxes that cities work into the billings with, uh, with a hotel. So, you know, I mean, you know, you know, you look at California and it's the sixth largest global economy, probably, probably fifth at this point. Yeah, I thought it was We're fifth. getting close mm -hmm. to fifth. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and, and you look at the huge economic engine that hospitality, tourism, and travel is, um, you know, besides Disneyland, you know, we've got, uh, uh, Universal Studios. That's the, the largest, uh, 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 tourist destination in LA County. Wow. Um, and actually our, our coastline is for the entire state. You know, we've got a, we've got one of the most magnificent coastlines in the country. Um, and that's why, you know, coastal California hotels, boutiques and, and, and resorts are, you're going to pay a premium for, 
Um, you know, whether it's a sleepy little community up in the central coast, I was chasing a deal up there a couple of years ago and the numbers, uh, unfortunately somebody else started bidding, bidding it up and we got to a point where I couldn't make sense of the numbers and they certainly could on their, on for their deal. So, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to build. It's expensive to build, but you know, you get into the right location um, you know, you, you, you've, you've got a home run. You've got, you've got a generational hold in some cases. But I was lucky enough to be involved with a hotel in, in the Anaheim Resort. Uh, area, the just going to bring that up. Yeah, go so, on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a license to print money. It yeah. really is. Between the convention center, uh, the, you know, uh, you get something like NAM uh, into Anaheim, and it sells out virtually every hotel throughout Orange County. Okay? Right. Okay. Um, and that Star Wars you know, you is just the, gonna be the topic. Print, that is going to be printing money for hoteliers too when that opens up next year in probably next spring. Absolutely, and, and it's funny we uh, uh, we we shut down a hotel on Catella and and repositioned it. Uh, it was an independent, and we brought it into the IHG family. Um, and put roughly about eight million dollars into it, including a uh, a pool on third floor deck. And I was just a proponent of hanging on to this. Um, you know, I actually tried to buy uh, uh, an equity stake in it uh, when when they you know, before they were taking it to, to market. They just sold it. Yep. Like, no, you want to hang on to it through the, the opening year of Star Wars because. You know, your your occupancy and your rates are going to go crazy. Then you're going to get top dollar for it. So I think they sold it and left a lot of money on the table. And really, if I would have been able to put a deal together on that, I would have kept it and, you know, given it to my uh, grandson at some point. Well, this is depressing. This is now uh, the uh, the show of missed opportunities for Craig Sullivan. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's been a couple of them, yeah. A couple of them, that's for sure. But you know what? It just keeps me fired up to look for the next one. So. Yeah, it, it, it sure does. What are you most excited about in terms of uh, the California hotel market in the next uh, 12 months, for example? You know, the next 12 months, I am really excited about uh, the select service opportunities that are going to be coming online across the state. Um, you know, there's some projects in, in downtown L.A. Um, that would be – an opportunity for a Hyatt, Hyatt centric with a you know, mixed use opportunity there. Um, and I think, I think there's some, some, we're getting some more Hilton product into orange County. We've had a couple of them open up uh, last year and, and this year, we've got another one set to open up later this year over by John Wayne airport. Um, you know, we've got uh, what used to be the Fairmont um it's it's in Newport Beach, but just barely. It's on this side of the line. Right. It's across uh, the road from John Wayne Airport. It's a beautiful hotel. It was a Fairmont for a number of years. Um, and then uh, the great folks over at Crescent Hotels bought it, and they're putting in over, I think, $20 million in renovations. Wow. And on Monday, it becomes a renaissance. So there's a scoop for your audience. Well, it's pretty cool. Uh, they. It sounds to me like yep. this might be the perfect place for you to uh, continue to hold click now that you're going to be outgrowing your current space. You know, there's very good possibility of that. Mm. Very good possibility. Well, we're just going to have to. Uh, so, we're just going to have to keep uh, keep on track with th with this one, seeing where Click 2019 is going to be. Hey, maybe you guys, maybe you could send yeah. in your uh, best guess to me uh, at Traveling Glenn on uh, Twitter and Instagram, for example, and let us know where you think Click 2019 should be. All right, any uh, any other thoughts uh, there, Craig, on what's going on in the uh, California hotel market before we wrap things up? You know, um, I, th there's always an opportunity in the Golden State, and I, I, I get up every morning excited to get, you know, the news from you and various other sources and, you know, go out and see these new hotels and, and uh, start increasing my databases and, and everything information-wise that I can absorb and, and bring in to help us look, look at deals and to help, uh, you know, uh, you know, for construction and, and, you know, value add and repositioning. Everybody wants that. There's, there's a few of them out there. I mean, I think if you, let's take San Francisco. 
Uh, you go to the corner of Grant and Bush. You're just outside of Chinatown. There's a few office buildings over there that could be a great opportunity for about a 60 key boutique hotel. So you got to search, you got to dig, but deals are out there and you know, you can get them done off market. Great. And I would that like, excites yeah. And I'd like to say, Hey guys, just, uh, Give me some, give me uh, some, a little bit of love on Patreon so I could actually start investing in hotels. I, you're all doing so great. I'm missing out on everything. It's making me very sad to miss out on this, uh, on, on this, Craig. But one thing that's not making me sad is getting to see you in uh, just a couple of few weeks over at at, at Click. That's going to be a great time. Looking forward to it, my friend. And you know what? Uh, we put a hotel deal together. You're definitely going to be involved. And. We're going to move the OC Talk Radio uh, station there, and you can broadcast uh, from there every time uh, you're, in the, you're in the Golden State. Dude, yeah. I, I absolutely love it. Love that idea. How cool is that? Now, before we go, how about a good, good quality, shameless plug from you? I want to thank all of the sponsors, speakers, uh, exhibitors, and the attendees who – They've made it possible to put on the California Lodging Investment Conference. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of people all pulling in the same direction to put on the, the event that we did last year and make it better this year. And, Glenn, you've been a huge part of that, and I thank you. And, you know, I, I can't wait for March 8th and to welcome everybody to the conference. I'm really looking forward to this. And, you know, it's it's just – it's. It, I, I think we've got something here where we've got a really good event that's very specific for our market. And, uh, I, I, I'm in, you know, we, we grew uh, this year. Uh, year one, we sold out at 232. And this year, we sold out at 252. And that was really the maximum amount we could put into the room where at the Hilton. And they've been great to me. And to uh, click and our attendees, uh, but we 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 are maxed with them. And wow. uh, it's you know I I really don't want to leave that hotel because we do have a great relationship with them and Christy Castle and the team over there are just tremendous to work with. So there's my long shameless plug. Yeah, I'm you know I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by the shamelessness. Story. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, good time. And uh, hey, you, you know, we're going to go to commercial break for a second. You're going to hear the click ad. And, uh, you know, sorry, too bad. You snooze, you lose. You'll have to, you know, keep it in your mind for 2019. Now, stay around because I've got an amazing interview with Ryan Rivet. He's the president and CEO of My Place Hotels of America, uh, an up and coming brand that's really starting to make an impact on the hospitality industry. They're, uh, they're young, they're an upstart, but have lots of experience. In fact, his grandfather actually founded a major hotel brand that each and every one of us know. So stick around, and after the commercial break, you will hear exactly what that brand was. So for uh, Craig Sullivan and I, thank you so much for listening, and we'll be right back after this message. Have a question for your host, Glenn? Tweet him now at Traveling Glenn. No vacancy. The hospitality industry's number one podcast will be right back. From Eureka to San Diego and Malibu to Bakersfield, the California Lodging Investment Conference, CLIC, is one of a kind, focusing exclusively on our Golden State's hotel market. CLIC was launched in 2016 by Craig Sullivan, a seasoned hospitality industry professional, to harness the knowledge of our industry leaders, support our community, and educate emerging talent. Click brings together lodging professionals from California and beyond for one day of learning, professional development, and networking. If you are an owner, operator, investor, broker, developer, lender, management company, brand, or professional services provider, you should plan on attending Click 2 on March 8, 2018 at the Hilton Irvine Orange County Airport. We invite you to go check out the California Lodging Investment Conference website at cliconference.com for the latest details and sponsorship opportunities. Early registration now open. And as a listener of the No Vacancy with Glenn Hausman podcast, please make sure to use our exclusive discount code of No Vacancy when registering for this one-of-a-kind in California hospitality event that sold out in its very first year. Back to the show. It's No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman. 
All right, so it strikes me as uh, interesting that today I'm going to be uh, talking to uh, somebody from Aberdeen, South Dakota. You know, to me as a New York, Long Island guy, I find it hard to believe that people actually live in South Dakota. But not only do they live in South Dakota, but they happen to be creating a successful hotel brand kind of away from the spotlight and the uh, stigma of the rest of the hospitality industry. And that's why I have uh, uh, Mr. Ryan Rivet with me today, who's the president and CEO of My Place Hotels, uh, an upstart economy extended stay brand. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, Glenn. Glad to be on the show this morning. And uh, it's uh, it's a balmy uh, three degrees here in Aberdeen, South Dakota. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm thinking about you down in New York with the nicer weather that uh, you have there. I, yeah, usually, uh, usually I'm the one who's being made fun of by my friends in Florida or Southern California, but you actually have real street cred when it comes to cold weather. Forget the whole hotel thing, but I'm just impressed that you can handle that weather up there, which gets so dang cold into the like negative 20 sometimes. I see. Right, it makes you appreciate the summer months a lot more, <laughs> and. Uh, we, we certainly offset the the lack of outdoor activities in the winter with uh, with a lot of things happening during the summer. We don't spend much time inside. In fact, uh, we've got a we've got a nice courtyard outside of our office, and you pretty commonly find people sitting out there during the summertime working and uh, and having meetings and things just to just to offset all the time we spend indoors during the off months. So. Yeah, and and you know not to uh, to ruin the mystery of life over here at the uh, No Vacancy News and, and Podcast, but when the weather gets warm, I love sitting in the backyard, sitting at my table, and doing all of my work from there because uh, outdoors is just the the best. But you know, Ryan, you're up there, you're in South Dakota, you're kind of separated from everybody. Well, of course, we're all connected because the internet and airplanes and stuff like that. But it strikes me, and I start to wonder: Are you crazy? Or are you in completely sane when it comes to trying to create uh, an exciting new hotel brand um, going up against all these massive companies that are all consolidating and become big, giant monsters? And here you are all the way out there with 30-something hotels under my place uh, under the My Place banner. Um, what were you thinking starting this thing? Well, um, I think it's a lot of the conversation that led up to starting my place went back to, to our roots. And so as you talk about Aberdeen and you talk about uh, family business, as you mentioned in the introduction, I, you know, this is a, this is a, a legacy of, to some degree for us. Uh, my partner in my place and my grandfather, mm-hmm. Ron Rivet was a uh, co-founder of super eight motels in 1973. Yep. Um, right here in Aberdeen. And in fact, we, uh, we still own the very first Super 8 motel here in Aberdeen and operate it. And it's still uh, a Super 8 today? Absolutely. That is so and, cool. Uh, and uh, it, it will, uh, as, far as, uh, as far as we can control, it will remain a Super 8 for as long as uh, they leave it in there. For, uh, for a number of reasons. One, it still operates very well. And, mm-hmm. and two, uh, uh, there's some sentimental value involved in that. So, so uh, when we look back to our roots in the hospita- hospitality industry, um, you know, we grew Super 8 here, and I see. I say we rather loosely, as uh, as I wasn't around for the first period of it. But um, you know, growing Super 8 from the first property here in 1973 to uh, just under 1,100 properties in the chain uh, at the time the the franchise company was sold in uh, 1993 uh, was was really uh, a, a, quite a quite an undertaking and a great success. I mean, to be able to take a small town, 25,000 people in the middle of the country and uh, generate uh, a corporate structure of uh, four or 500 individuals at any given time uh, and a growth of, in many of the initial 10 years of operations there, or 20 years of of franchising, uh, 150 to 200 franchises sold a year. That's incredible. uh, Pretty phenomenal. You talk about Aberdeen, South Dakota, relative to the hospitality industry. I've always been amazed at, in my travels, how many people within the hotel industry know Aberdeen, uh, how many hoteliers there are in our community here, uh, and how many success stories within the hospitality business there are that stem from, from yeah. this town. All right, so before we get into talking about the My Place experience, let's let's keep that clock rolled back a little bit and talk about that. Um, you know, uh, growing up in a, in a family that had its own hotel brand that was seeing tremendous success, that must have been a, a really interesting experience for you because typically I speak to a lot of folks that are, you know, second or third generation Americans, for example, that grew up in a 
hotel because their parents came over to this country. So they grew up in the back room doing all those jobs. But for you, it was a little bit different. You weren't just in a hotel. You were uh, growing up in a, as a, a major chain was burgeoning and spreading its wings all the way across the United States. Yeah, it, it was definitely, uh, definitely unique. And one of the unique things about it is that in, in growing up, um, uh, relative to my family situation, I spent a lot of time with my grandfather. He is the primary uh, figure in my life. And so uh, along with that came a lot of opportunities to get exposed to the business, the hospitality business, and, and our organization in general from a pretty young age. So I spent lots of time in the office and around the office. There's stories that, uh, in fact, we've got a number of people that work for us today who've been working here for over 40 years and are able to tell a lot of stories about uh, me coming in uh, as a young guy and um, oh, over 40 years hope, that like that, that I think that guys. was before even you <laughs> right oh, yeah it was certainly <laughs> hey, there's uh, there's some there's some, some definite loyalty within uh, the ranks of our organization wow. here and uh, so you know it, it really the business we're in today is really a lot of uh, continuation uh, of what was started in 1973, although uh, we've gone through a lot of changes as an organization, of course, growing Super 8 to that level, then selling the, the, the franchise company but remaining in the hospitality business as a vertically integrated uh, group of companies and developing hotels uh, of all major brands for a period of 20 years. Right. Um, you know, that's really the, the different boxes on the timeline that led us up to where we're at today. Hmm. That's a uh, uh, that's pretty cool, and I and I I think that's one of the things that's missing. I see you um out there, for example. I'll just say like uh, at a Hoa event, but it doesn't seem plainly obvious to me when you look at it. It from the outside, it looks like oh hey, we're just starting out. We're this new company, but you have this incredible rich history and have actually been in the development business for decades upon decades upon decades. So you're really rooted in everything hospitality and have much much more experience than the uh, the average uh, corporate professional, I'd say. Yeah, I, I think uh, myself individually, um, I, you know, I've gained a lot of experiences through the, the family business since I was really young. But collectively, uh, as a group of people, as I mentioned, you know, we've got people that have been here for 25, 30, 35, and, and over 40 years for a few of them. Um, and so the, the collective intelligence that we have to, relative to the hospitality business is, is far more than uh, just a just a, a new brand that's a few years old uh, or a few people who have been involved in the hotel business for a little while. Um, and, uh, you know, really the, the organization that we have here um, is, is substantially larger than uh, what most would expect, as you said. Having been through the initial stages of, of launching and growing a new brand, I would not recommend it to anybody uh, with less resources <laughs> or experience than what we have, because it's a huge challenge, it's a really. Big challenge. Uh, all right, well, you you ruined my spring because I was about to develop my own hotel brand and just knock that off my list. But I guess I'm gonna not do that anymore. I just buy at my place. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a it's probably a a smart move for me to do. Okay, so um, you you guys are there. Um, it's I would. I'm going to guess now with the first hotel opened in early 2012, um, you're probably thinking um, in the early days of the Great Recession, hey, what's going on here? What are we going to do to take control of our own destiny? Is that a fair assessment of what happened, or am I just misguessing the entire story? You know, I'll say that that perspective definitely played into uh, the conversation uh, at, at the time, but uh, a lot of it really had to do with going back – not not a long time, but 10, 15 years prior to that, to uh, an objective that, that Ron had at the time. And it was a period after selling Super 8, we're continuing to develop. Um, at that time, I guess, through whatever means, he had identified that, the, hey, the extended stay model looks pretty cool. I yep. like the idea that seems to be growing in some places. Um, he took that, that idea to some of his key business partners and, and some employees and said, maybe we should start a brand. Unfortunately, at that time, uh, he, he couldn't get any traction. Most of the most of the business partners and the people were busy uh, either golfing uh, because they had somewhat retired at that point, right. or were busy developing other hotel brands and just said, "You know, I don't want to put that on my plate." And so he 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 rolled that forward a while and and sort of let the idea lay dormant. I entered the business in 2005 um, and uh, started working in development and construction, and then. 
uh, progressively took over some more responsibilities in different areas of the corporate structure. And, and uh, so in 2011, um, a conversation over, uh, over dinner, he brought that up again and, and almost verbatim, I could say what he said is, I had this idea 15 years ago or so, couldn't get any traction with any of the other guys with it. But you're here now, and you don't have a choice. So <laughs> I, <laughs> that was that was pretty much the way it went. It was fairly simple to begin with, and after that, it was what I think we need to do is we need to go back to our our economy, or he often refers to the economy segment as the old timers do the budget uh, brand, and 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 look at operating a hotel efficiently. Look at bringing back bottom line uh, to our hotel operations look at uh, better franchise practices um, and and so all of those things that were key fundamentals in, in growing the Super 8 brand as successfully as they did could be rolled forward into uh, our current organization which uh, really very much resembles what it was before only scaled down a bit at that time um, and and so you know those were the those were the fundamentals of here's what we should get started on and then beyond that it was why don't you go out and take a look at everything and figure out a plan and come up with a name and let's uh let's see what we can get done and and so it really just uh just sort of developed from there as we studied the industry studied the competitors uh and identified a niche space in the industry today that uh, was relatively underserved and really pretty much vacant um, at that time right? Uh, relative to what we want to do and continues primarily to be vacant now other than my place growing. Well, I am uh, unabashedly in love with the extended stay product and the opportunity I think it has for hoteliers. And you were definitely way ahead of uh, a lot of different folks when creating this particular brand and this particular point of view. Um, I see the major hotel brands since then have caught on to it and they're trying to copy what you're doing maybe not in the uh, economy extended stay segment, but they're definitely um, focused on it and trying to acquire brands that uh, will compete more head to head against you. But the other thing that you're doing is, uh, you know, you're not, you're not out there trying to build hotels in the biggest cities or around the country. I mean, you're in Aberdeen, it's a small city and that seems to be a, a model that seems to be working for you and, um, and an area that the major hotel brands seem to be ignoring. So you're in like Billings, Montana, Missoula, Montana, Grand Forks, North Dakota, Lubbock, Texas, West Valley City, Utah, uh, a lot of cities that I've heard of but never have had the chance to uh, experience myself. Do you think that small town look has given you a strategic advantage? Uh, possibly. Uh, I think in a, in a lot of ways, like you said, there's there's not as much attention being paid to those secondary and tertiary markets as there is to the primary markets mm -hmm. in recent times. Um, and, and really, we didn't set out to, to be a, a small market or secondary and tertiary brand. Right. It's just uh, Those are markets that, that we're comfortable in. They're also markets that we identified on an individual basis opportunity in. Um, you know, th at the present time and in 2018, we'll see My Place Hotels open in several more primary yeah. markets, um, which is which is also exciting for us. It's really diversifying uh, the portfolio mm -hmm. and uh, the demand profile uh, for My Place as a as a chain. Uh, yeah, so, I think you're you're looking at what Colorado Springs, North Las Vegas, uh, a couple of more cities that people are more familiar with. Sure. Yeah, and and uh, and some some others, uh, the Chicagoland area. Ooh, nice. Uh, we're opening up in. Uh, we're uh, Indianapolis is another project oh, that's uh, mm -hmm. getting ready to uh, go hard here in the next uh, sixty days or so. Um, you know, Wixom, Michigan, again another small community, but but really part of the greater Detroit area, which which is really starting to come back. By the way, we we're pretty excited about that area. Um, and so, you know, I, I think what we're seeing is is a little bit of a uh, little bit more maturity in the brand as we enter 2018, um, where the barriers to entry in larger markets uh, relative to our platform are starting to match up real well. And by by that I mean, you know, we designed my place as a 64 unit prototype, and one of the key uh, factors in in doing that was identifying that there are a lot of communities, a lot of hotel submarkets um, where there are small pieces of land, one to one and a half acre sites that the bigger brands generally can't fit on because mm -hmm. of their demand requirements for larger room counts. And so we said, hey, if we design this 
this efficient model, this space efficient model, we can go into large markets where many of our competitors can't get into and, and establish our niche right there just by virtue of being small enough to fit on some of the sites. So, uh, you know, that, that's been exciting to see that, that play out in some of the larger markets here um, in, in, in the last 12 months or so. That's pretty, uh, that, that's pretty cool uh, that you're doing it. You definitely seem to have momentum uh, behind you at this point. I want to talk about that momentum, but I do want to talk about what those initial days were like when you were tasked, um, you know, you, you were tasked with having to bring this brand to, to life. How do you convince those first people to make that investment in you and a brand that nobody's heard of because it doesn't yet exist. You know, I'll say it didn't take a whole lot of convincing. In fact, the first the first franchisees coming into the chain reached out to us. Wow. Um, spent time in the first the first few phone calls or the first few meetings. Uh, it was amazing to hear people selling us on the concept that we had created. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, that really continues to be the case today. There are right. a lot of people coming in that say, yeah, I've been watching you and what you guys are doing is refreshing. I like the idea. You know, I think that this might fit really well in this location and here's why. Those are, that's the nature of the conversations remaining today. But initially, you know, for us, um, open the first property in, in February of 2012. From February of 12 until January 1st of 14, uh, we built five properties. Uh, we built those within our own organization, constructed them, developed them, and, and manage them within uh, our management company. And so, you know, we're owner operators effectively. And that's yeah. the way we decided to prove the concept of the brand. And, and at our core, that's really what we are. That's what we like to refer to ourselves as, as hotel operators. So that's where, that's where we've always been the most successful we've always been the most profitable uh and and really the the core of the the hotel franchise brand the development model everything really uh rolls up to how well the operations are doing and so uh our objective was to build them make sure that we could build them for a sustainable cost to operate them and make sure that the operating concept uh made sense that the consumers received uh, the marketing of the property well, and uh, that really organically uh, we could capture some demand in the markets we went into. And so in, uh, in 2014, as the first franchisees came along, um, it, it was a fairly easy conversation to have because, like I said, they had really sold themselves based on what they had seen us already doing. Right. All right, so tell me a little bit about why um, somebody should operate and build a my place economy extended stay property. What are some of the value propositions that you're that you're out there talking about that says, "Hey, look at us. Eh, don't look at the other guys." Sure. Well, I think you know what we to begin with. What we've designed is a is a very reasonably sized investment mm -hmm. uh, in a world where the other competitive hotel brands and the major development within our industry is all individual properties requiring an investment of 10, 12, 15 million dollars. Um, we, we've designed something that is, is a much more reasonable scale. Right. And so it's, uh, it's an opportunity for a lot of in investors, a lot of, a lot of developer owner operators, uh, to either one enter the hotel industry, um, or to diversify their portfolio, uh, both geographically, um, and from an offering standpoint. And so, you know, I, I think we hang our hat on that a lot, that we've, that we've created a very well-balanced um, concept here from, you know, hey, let's spend around about $5 million in each location as opposed to spending 10 or $12 million in each location. Granted, we have less units, but we've designed a much more efficient operating concept that to some degree is inherent with the extended stay model, but, but also... Uh, has a lot to do with how we've designed um, the, the operating platform, the training, the marketing perspectives uh, as, as we've designed them as owner operators. So it's very easy to pass on to franchisees and, and for them to execute on. Right. It's that market. Uh, I think it's that marketing and sales thing, which is uh, more of the challenge than the how many full time employees you're going to have, because the extended stay model is really geared towards having a very, very uh, scaled down number of uh, FTEs. Typically, it's right. just, uh, you know, a, a few people to uh, run the front desk, operate the hotel. Uh, housekeeping doesn't have to be as extensive. Uh, I don't know your brand familiar enough, but I'm going to guess that is at, you don't have daily housekeeping. It's probably every four or five days. Is that 
correct? Yeah, that's that's the that's the basic concept, and of course we offer daily housekeeping right. upon request. So you know, it's, it's a matter of servicing the guests, but as a standard, you find most people, and I mean myself included, I check into a hotel, I put the do not disturb yeah. sign on the door, uh, and don't really want anybody in my room while I'm there. That's so true, and you uh, know what, Ryan, I got to tell you, I used to be like, what? They're going to not clean my room today? And then I realized, you, you know, I don't care. It doesn't make a difference. In fact, I like the uh, the heightened level of privacy, especially in this day and age, and Honestly, if I have to take an evaluation of who I am completely as a human being, I'm not changing my sheets every day at home, let alone, sure. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, even every four or five days. So it doesn't make it doesn't make sense in a, in a lot of ways. So I'm starting to think customers in general are coming around to the idea that you don't need that and you'd rather see different amenities or a lower price point for entry. Right. Well, and you know, that that's a huge weakness within the extended stay uh, segment and also a huge opportunity for us, um, and that is educating the the consumer on extended stay. Amazingly enough, as as much as the extended stay segment has grown uh, in in recent years, the last 10, 12 years, we've also seen that the the consumer remains um, widely, you know, uh, uninformed of what the core concepts and value proposition of extended stay is. And so, you know, one thing that a lot of extended stay uh, properties, you know, look towards is, is getting a real high volume of, of long-term staying guests. Um, we, we focus on a, on, a, uh, on a more balanced matrix of long-term and short-term guests so that we can, one, get as many people through the door uh, as possible to continue creating loyalty, but also uh, to, to balance the, the uh XPAR as, along with revenue maximization. So, you know, get the extended stay guests through the doors to the point where you're covering uh, your expenses and then use the rest of that demand to, uh, to uh, maximize your revenue. And, and that's where extended stay really performs well also, that you have some more flexibility within the rate structure relative to uh, – to levels of occupancy on a daily basis. Yeah, and, and I'm also going to go out on a limb here and say that I, I think when the average consumer who discovers the extended stay product, say they may uh, inadvertently stay at one of your hotels without understanding what extended stay is, when they see the in-room amenities and the experience that they could have with an extended stay product, they suddenly like it a whole lot more, and I think they're more likely to return than if you had a, a, a just a traditional hotel product, which I'm finding a, a lot more trouble differentiating between the different products I see out there in the market. Very, very true. And, and you find that as well, that it seems with the more products that come online in the, in the select and limited service and, you know, mid-scale, upper mid-scale segments that uh, it's tougher and tougher to differentiate from one brand to the other. And so the bigger differentiating point for the, for the consumer these days is what, what we're seeing as we survey guests is their differentiation between a standard hotel and an extended stay hotel, which right. makes the extended stay all that much more attractive to them. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think that the hotel industry at large, and this is a, just a generalization, people listening out there, I think that um, there seems to be, um, a, 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 you know, even though swim lane seems to be the big phrase that we're seeing out there right now, each brand has to have a distinct um, lane and it cannot cross into the other brands. I think it is an industry we've convinced ourselves that that matters. Customers, I don't think, look at it that way. They don't really see the difference between a hotel that charges uh, let's say $83 a night as opposed to $87 a night, but the major brands say those are two different hotel brands completely, right? Um, but you can much more clearly understand the difference between the regular hotel and an extended stay um, hotel out there. But Ryan, I want to ask you, um, playing in the extended stay economy segment, what are some of the opportunities that you have there? And maybe what are some of the challenges that you, you experience there too? Well, I think... You know, the, the biggest challenge is, is really defining economy. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the general perspective, I'd say more so in the franchise community than in the consumer-facing right. uh, side of marketing for us, the economy is somewhat of a dirty word. You know, the, right. the, the economy brands of old um, have reached the top of their bell curve and in most cases are, are sliding down the other side relative to, 
to profitability or to quality or to many different factors. Mm-hmm. Um, and so part of, part of, part of the challenge is that convincing other people, uh, the franchise community that there's nothing wrong with this type of economy, that this is today's economy and it's something new. Uh, we commonly refer to my place as a mid scale product at an economy price. Now, that really doesn't make any sense to the consumer because they don't look at hotels as mid-scale versus economy. They purely look at price, quality, review ratings, et cetera. But to the franchise community, uh, that, that helps define a little bit what we're focused on. And so, you know, those are, those are some of the bigger challenges. I think the opportunities that lie uh, in, in our path are that, like I just said, so many of our economy competitors across the country um, have have – stumbled a bit and properties are getting old quality and consistency aren't as uh, aren't as big of key factors in their offering and value proposition today and so that makes that gives us an opportunity to approach their guests by as we enter a new market by advertising a brand new product with a heightened level of quality uh, in many cases eight ten twelve fifteen dollars a night more than what the economy can are charging. Right. At the same time, uh, inherent to our niche, we can look at the, the, the newer upscale or upper mid-scale competitor in the market and say, hey, you know, they have a nice property, uh, good location, uh, but we really have the same thing. We're just charging a lesser price for it. Um, and we've shaved off a few of the amenities, some of the things that most people don't generally use when they stay at a hotel. And that's what really allows us to uh, to operate at those levels and, and offer that, that uh, uh, discount. And so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of opportunity in that we, as my place, we can pull from both sides of our competitive set in each marketplace that we go into. Mm-hmm. Um, and in many cases, there's equal opportunity there. Uh, in some places, we find more opportunity on the economy side. Some places, more opportunity on the, the upper mid-scale side. And so, you know, at, at the Highland Group, for instance, is, as they've uh, evaluated extended stay, and, and in my conversations and, and work with Mark Skinner, he's defined my place in his mid-scale segment of his reports relative to quality and price point. Uh, we fit really well right there. And so it, it's somewhat of a conundrum as, we're, as we're, we've identified as economy. However, in today's world, price point and, and uh, uh, quality really puts us in the mid-scale or even upper mid-scale segment. Right. Okay. So first of all, conundrum. Great word. Love it. But so then why use economy at all? Why draw that line in the sand? Is it for the, uh, the owners of the buildings, for the customers? What's your thought behind that? Um, I think, you know, conceptually is more for the customers. Mm-hmm. What we wanted to make sure we were able to do um, is be overt in, in advertising to that, econ- that set of economy customers in the marketplace that, uh, that are somewhat displaced. They're the people that travel and, and 15, 20 years ago said, whenever I travel, I only stay at a Super 8 because I find quality and consistency each time I stay. Right. Um, those people are there, and, and like I said, they're somewhat displaced because they're, they're just against paying $120 a night for a hotel room. Uh, but at the same time, they're not the type of people that are willing to accept uh, insufficient uh, or subpar quality in the hotel that they go into. And so... You know, as we started my place, we were really focused on on that group of people as as our as our primary demographic or our foundational demographic. Um, what we found today is that our demographics uh, profiles are very wide ranging uh, and very diverse. Uh, but we do see a lot of those people that we initially targeted in there, and and I think uh, the economy moniker really. Uh, really helped us with that initially today is it as important i'm not so sure right. i think as we establish ourselves more within the industry and in the consumer facing distribution uh it's probably something that could come off of the sign without very much impact yeah i would i would think so in fact uh you know other brands that were playing in the economy space even tried to get away from the words economy or value entirely um because they didn't sure. find it necessary but um you know before we wrap up here today <coughs> You know, so what is it that you think your core customer is really looking at? And you said a wide demographic, but um, who is, if you put into a psychographic profile, their personality, how they view themselves, who is that particular customer? Well, I, I think the, the customers that, that we're serving the best um, are 
are those that are evaluating um, the proxim- proximity of price and value as they as they collide. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's they're looking at the value proposition and saying, um, you know, I can get more bang for my buck out of this, uh, and and that's really what brings them back. I mean, we we like to um, evaluate our service on a daily basis on, in all of our operations. We've dedicated a lot of time to that, and and we look very closely at what consumer responses are. And I think that's the most common uh, response is that I wouldn't have expected to get this nice of a place for this low of a rate. Beautiful. And so those are the people that uh, seem to be our, our best customer. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that dynamics uh, subject to change as we grow too. And it's pretty exciting to see that happen. Yeah, absolutely. How uh, how exciting it is for you to be uh, part of this, to uh, take that family legacy. The baton has been passed to you. You've been CEO of the company for, what, just a little over a year now at this point? Right. Yeah, and, you know, to, to take it forward. That's uh, just super awesome. Okay, before we wrap up, I just want to make sure, is there anything else that you want to say? And then I'm going to let you do some shameless plugs. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think so. We, we really... Uh we really run the roadmap here. Uh, and so I, I appreciate you, uh, going through it from, from stem to stern to this point. Yeah, it was really great story. Love hearing it. And, uh, now I want you to, uh, to do the, the, the shameless blogs. I'll start you off. If you're interested in learning more about my place from an ownership perspective, check out myplacehotels.com slash franchising. Talk to, uh, talk to the team over there and they'll uh, help figure it out. Uh, now, uh, how much more shameless can you get than I already have there, Ryan? Well, I'm not sure, um, but you know, we're, we're the rapid growth we're experiencing in my place is going to put us in a lot more markets uh, in the coming 12 months. Uh, you'll find us located next to your hotel, inevitably. So, uh, <laughs> might as well buy the franchise before we uh, end up next to you with somebody else. How shameless is that? I love it. That uh, was that was beautiful. <laughs> I'm going to take it and put it on a frame on my wall. It was awesome. <laughs> we we, uh, we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort working to uh, to build relationships and to get people here to Aberdeen. Now, you might be apprehensive to come here during the, during the winter months, uh, but inevitably the people that come and visit us here uh, to, to learn about us, learn who we are, um, end up buying a franchise. We have 100% success rate to that, with that to this point, and we'll continue that. So uh, we look forward to visiting with uh, anybody out there that has an interest in my place. And really our objective is not to uh, throw uh, sales pitches or plugs out, but to introduce them to what we've created and the people who make it work um, and, and develop relationship and, uh, and, and ultimately partnership with our franchisees. Awesome. Well, I've uh, had a great time talking to you, and I may make my way out to Aberdeen, but not until July. I'm sorry. <laughs> not <laughs> not going to happen. I'm having a hard enough time here in my uh, 20-something degree level. You know, I don't need to get involved in your negative 20 degree uh, weather over there. But, uh, you know, thanks so much for, uh, for being here with me today. Thank you. I was glad to, glad to spend the time. Yeah, I, I was too, and I want to thank everybody for listening to another episode of the No Vacancy Podcast. What a fun topic that is. I really, truly believe, and you could check back in my catalog of shows to see my unabashed love of the extended stay segment and the service department segment too, because they are so interesting, they are growing, and to me, it's the big trend of 2017 and going into 2018 as we're experiencing it now. So thanks so much for listening. For me and uh, Ryan, I want to thank you guys for being here today, and I'll be back next Next week, that is on, unless I decide to get some guts and travel to uh, Aberdeen and probably freeze to death. Okay, guys, see you next week. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much for listening to No Vacancy, the hospitality industry's number one podcast with your host, Glenn Hausman, online at Rouse.media, on Twitter at Traveling Glenn, and on Facebook.com slash Glenn.Hausman. We'll catch you next time.